what are you really good at? And that's what you should lead with, right? Hey there. Thanks for coming by. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 364. Today, I'm joined by my guest, Sensei Shafi Bacchus. My name is Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host for the show. I'm the founder at Whistlekick. I love the martial arts and I love my job because my job is martial arts. I get to talk to wonderful people and I get to participate in creating amazing products. And you can find all of those products at whistlekick.com. Don't forget the code podcast15 to save 15%. Now, if what you're after is maybe a transcript or one of the other 363 episodes that we've made, you can find all of them at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. You can listen to every episode there or on YouTube, but the website is really where we give you the most background, the most context, photos and videos and transcripts, and we've got episodes broken down by location and style, so if you really want to dig in to something from someone near you or someone that practices a similar or the same style that you do, that's the best place to go, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. But let's talk about today's guest. Like many of our episodes, Sensei Shafi Bacchus was a listener referral. But this listener actually goes back quite a ways and is one of the listeners that I've had the opportunity to meet and train with. And so that always means, I don't want to say more, but gives me more background. So in this particular person, shout out to Chris, reached out and said, you know, I really want you to interview this man who I'm training with now. We bounced some messages back and forth, and I came to understand why, even with all of the training that Chris had, why Sensei Bacchus represented something different to him and for him, and why I was excited to have him on the show. Now, I'm not going to spoil any of that for you, but I did enjoy today's episode, so I hope that you do as well. I'll welcome him to the show now. Sensei Bacchus, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you very much. I really appreciate the opportunity, especially to be interviewed by Whistlekick that has interviewed, you know, some of the real greats like John Ree and so forth. So thank you very much for the opportunity. Well, thank you for being here. I've been looking forward to this. You were, as we had just talked about, you were a referral from someone who's been listening to the show for a very long time, and I'm sure he's going to hear this episode. So shout out to Chris. Thank you for your support and for making this connection. Yes, yes. Chris is one of my very dedicated students, and um, I, I uh, have a lot of respect for him, and I'm grateful that he, you know, was able to identify this opportunity for us. Yeah. Yeah, I've been looking forward to it. And, and I've got to say, I think our conversation today holds the record for the furthest scheduled out. <laughs> it's it's been a few months that we've had this on the calendar oh wow yeah <laughs> which you know what that's okay good good things come to those who wait and and all those cliches we've been you know looking at this and and planning for this and so i have no doubt it's going to be a great time for both of us excellent <laughs> well we are a martial arts show and we do talk about martial arts and the thing that we always start with, as simple as it seems, it's pretty important. How did you get started in the martial arts? Well, I am one of those people that grew up, you know, um, every Saturday watching uh, Kung Fu martial art movies and in the genre of the five deadly venoms and so forth. I grew up in Guyana, which is a very small country in South America. It's in the northernmost um, tip of South America. And there's not a lot of martial arts there. Um, I think we had some Taekwondo and we had Shotokan Karate. Um, and that was it. There was no Judo, Jiu Jitsu, definitely no Kung Fu. Um, but I would religiously go to movies every Saturday and then I'd come home and I'd practice. And around 13 years or so, we moved to a house. Um, and in that house, I found a couple of martial art geese that was left back at, um, by the previous tenant. Um, these were the Japanese style white geese. You know, at least I had the uniform. And that prompted me to go looking f 
for dojos, and I found the Shotokan Karate Dojo. Um, my parents weren't too thrilled about it. Uh, it was not something that people generally did in Guyana, um, but that's how I started. Um, I remember going there, and my sensei, his name was uh, is um, Keith Da Costa. He's now a seventh dan, um, living in Canada, and I also trained with Frank Winatai Sensei, who's an eighth degree uh, black belt now. Back then, these guys were all second and third degree, and they were at their prime. And um, I started with Shotokan Karate. Wow. You know, we've heard a lot of different origin stories here on this show, but I think you're the first person that had a uniform, a gi, before they started training. Yeah. That's, I mean, that, I, that's I, kind I, of I a funny have... way to get into it, isn't it? Indeed, indeed. You know, it's something you always, I always wanted to do, but by just having that, that, that symbol, I guess, um, you know, it just kind of prompted me into taking the, the next step, right? Because I was in, in a community that kind of promoted martial arts. And, you know, it was growing up in the West Indies, the game we played the most was soccer and cricket. You know, those were the, those were the sports, yeah. not, not martial arts per se. Um, and then it was only Japanese martial arts that we had in, in Guyana. I think that one school that was Taekwondo, which is Korean. But that was it. Do you think that you would have ultimately found martial arts without that random occurrence, that left behind uniform? I have to tell you that by 13, I had already had Makiwaria in my yard, I already had, um, I had built like a, um, a, uh, I had built some things to practice on, you know? Um, so I was already practicing seriously. Um, I had gotten a book, a couple of books from the, um, from the library. And one was a Gozo Shioto Sensei's Aikido. And in that book, he had described how to do break fall. And I would practice and I had, the downstairs was concrete and we had like some old mats and whatnot I had put down there and some carpet. I mean, my friends would practice across the streets. Our other friends were practicing break dancing and we were practicing like how to take a fall, you know? <laughs> so there was a lot of interest there. And I think gi or no gi, I, I would have found martial arts some way in some shape, form or, you know, um, eventually. You know, I, I have this theory. I have a couple. Of th I have a lot of theories, I'll be honest. But one of the theories I have is that people that are destined for martial arts will find martial arts. You know, we've we've heard too many weird stories on this <laughs> show of people who ended up in martial arts through strange circumstances, you know, including someone miraculously leaving behind now a couple of geese to catalyze you into going out and finding your training. Do you, you know, agree? Do you, do you think martial arts was something you were destined for? I wouldn't be so bold, but okay. it definitely is something that I've always kind of connected with. Mm -hmm. um, I think our societies today were based on ideology that sprung out of a martial methodology, a martial way. Um, I think it's being critical to our survival as a species. And I so and so I think it's kind of innately built into us. Some of us tend to gravitate to it more, uh, some less. But a lot of people are somewhere in between there. Um, it's just what it, you know whether there's that catalyst that gets you involved, right? It's the competitive spirit that's exhibited in us, in us all, right? And I mean that's really linked to our success and how we express ourselves successfully in life. And so all, all these sports and everything that we do, to, to me, they're all martial arts um, because they all involve strategy. And to me, that's really the core of, of martial arts and what guides a martial artist. We just use different um, methods, you know, mm. to express it. Sure. Can you talk about that a little bit more? You're reminding me of the definition of Kung Fu that I hear so many people use, the idea of mastery, that everything could be Kung Fu depending on how you approach it. 
Absolutely. I mean, everything could be everything, right? Because when it comes down to the core of it, the person that's doing it is the human being. And so the limitations that are, are there for every human being, right? Two arms, two legs, a head, and so forth. And so in space, you can only move in a certain way. Regardless, you can't break those boundaries. So regardless of whatever art you're doing, I mean, one of the, one of the sports that I connect um, swordsmanship to is ice hockey. I mean, yeah, I'm up here in New England, so I do kind of watch a lot of ice hockey, but ice hockey is feet going in one direction, body in the opposite direction, and then you have your hockey stick in another direction, right? And you're coordinating three different parts of your body in space, and you're on ice. The resistance on the ground is minimal. And then you as a whole, your body, your sword, so your feet, your body, your sword, are all moving together or your, your hockey stick. Um, and you're moving through space. And at the same time, your mind is thinking, looking at all the different players and strategizing and how you're going to get between and move and so forth. To me, that's really a really good expression of martial arts because it takes, you have to have balance. Yeah, and all those things have to happen without you thinking. And any good martial artist gets to a point where they're not thinking as much. They're just reacting and not even reacting because once you're reacting, that means something has happened already on the other side. But if you're proactive, that means you have a level of awareness that is beyond that situation and then allows you to control that situation or to remove yourself from that situation if that's what you need to do. And I mean, that's how you survive as a martial artist for very long, I think. Mm. I would have to agree. Now, of course, where you started in life is not where you are in life today. Can you tell us a bit about how you got from, from there to here, we'll say? From Guyana to the US? Yeah. <laughs> Well, <clears throat> so I've always been, you know, a very dedicated student. Um, I always believe in, or my family <laughs> always believed in putting the best foot forward, right? So uh, growing up, you know, I was very studious um, in martial arts, in Shotokan karate, and also in my studies and so forth. And around 18, 19 years of age, I was able to get a student visa to come to the U.S. to study. And that was in 1990. I came to the U.S. then, and um, I studied uh, forensic toxicology at the City University of New York, and then I went on to study pharmacy, and after pharmacy, I did a pharmaceutical residency, and today I work with Janssen Pharmaceuticals. Um, I'm the lead for the U.S. Real World Value and Evidence team, um, and I'm based out of Boston. Uh, I think that Martial arts has been, you know, the core, the rod um, that kept me stable and strong throughout all that time. You know, a lot has changed. Um, I, you know, it's not, it, it's not possible for foreign students to do that, do what I did um, today, because things are different. But when I came to the U.S., I was able to get a work permit, and I was able to work as a paramedic in New York City. And I worked as a paramedic for 14, around 14 years. And it really gave me an amazing exposure to American society at all levels. Um, I worked all those years in Manhattan. I met everybody that you can imagine meeting, <laughs> uh, racist cultures and so forth. Um, granted, it was 45 minutes of that person's emergency, right? <laughs> So they probably weren't at their best, <laughs> but it really gave me the opportunity to learn about people um, and to be there to support them at that time. And so it, it's just been it's just been wonderful. I, I've been very lucky. I'm very blessed in that in that sense for those opportunities that I got since then to now. Mm. You know, I, I hadn't thought of it until now, but when we are hurt, when we're sick, if we go into an ambulance, mm -hmm. here. It's one of the few places in society that we don't have these tears. 
you know, there there are better hospitals and, and maybe less less hospitals, better cars, lower scale, lower class cars, food, restaurants, housing. But when we break a leg, we're all going on the same ambulance, aren't we? Absolutely. And um one of my one of my mentors um uh, told me once I was complaining because in New York City, you get call after call after call. When I was a medic there, we would do 1.3 million calls a year, which was just crazy. And I was complaining. And he, my, um, I'll, I'll, his, I'll give you his first name is uh, Al. And he said to me, Al said to me, he's like, Chaffee, why are you complaining? This is not your emergency. You're fine. It's their emergency. And it doesn't really matter whether it's a broken leg or a minor cut, you're not them. You don't know what that is. It's their, their emergency. And that just, that just clicked something in me. You know, it's just a mindset, right? It's their perception of an emergency, and so you just accept it. Um, I mean, and once I was able to do that, the job got so much easier. You know, and, and what you said, you put somebody in your ambulance, you know, it's their emergency. This is your hotel. <laughs> this is where you take care of them. This is your little space in the universe. And you are going to provide the best experience for them possible during their time of emergency. And, hey, it's only about 30 minutes. <laughs> you know, it's not a whole lot of time, right? right. Um, and it's really easy to make a bad impression. <laughs> and you, you definitely don't want to do that, right? Um, I mean, if it happens now and then, maybe can, that can be avoided. But in general, you don't want to make a bad impression to somebody when they're going through what is perhaps the worst time in their lives, you know? And that really set me straight. Um, and I think if I, because I was able to get that mentality and express it on a daily basis, I was able to last that long because they... The average time for a, um, a medic in New York City was around five years, and they would be burnt out, you know? Mm. And I was working. Stuff. Yeah, it's, it's very stressful. Um, it still continues to be stress, stressful because some of my best friends are and um, still working, and I stay in contact with them. And a lot has changed and gotten better. The technology is a lot better today. However, all the other stressors and the human aspects are still there. I mean, it's still a very stressful job. And I recently heard that there were, you know, several injuries, three or four injuries in, in Manhattan um, to medics. So um, I'm grateful for my time doing that job. Mm. It's an amazing job, you know, and, and I have the utmost respect for people who are first responders, people who are going to show up when mm -hmm. things by definition are not going well. You know, the 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 frame of mind that someone in that role has to have mm -hmm. just it's it's not something it's something that i i feel like i've experienced sometimes but i'm not going to do well when someone's guts are hanging out or when someone's <clears throat> bleeding and if i was around someone who passed away even if I had no, no ability to save them, but if they, if it happened, quote unquote, on my watch, I would be useless for months, if not years. So I, 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 I respect what you do so much or what you have done, I guess, so much and, and the others out there. Well, well, I still distinctly remember my first cardiac arrest and that lady that passed away. I can still see her face today. And I can still see my partner telling me, with his eyes that it's okay. <clears throat> but to come back to the topic of this radio station, I can tell you that I learned a lot of martial arts as a paramedic. Um, uh, for example, um, if you have an emotionally distraught person that's failing about and you want to take their blood pressure, which side of their body should you stand on? Should you take a blood pressure with them, or with, uh, you know, with them sitting or standing? It's always better for them to be sitting, you standing, because you'll be in a superior position. Um, it's good to be on the left side of them, so you have your right hand free. Um, <clears throat> so there's a, there's a lot of strategy in taking care of people, too, because they're not mindful of what they're doing. Um, but you, gotta, <laughs> you have to survive for the other person, right? 
on the next call. Uh, what about, you know, sometimes there, uh, you, we, when I first started, we worked with the fight on the police department and we would respond to the police department. Uh, when the police have a meet a call, we would go with them. We would stage outside in case there was an injury or whatnot. We would to take care of the police and to take care of, um, you know, who, whatever that um, perpetrator may, may need help. And later we did that for the fire department as well. And then a lot of those guys were, you know, military trained. A lot of them knew martial arts. They knew military style martial arts. And so we had, we had training groups. And I didn't officially train for about 10 years um, while I was working as a medic and going to school. I, and I did both full time. Um, and so that was a, quite a, a workload, but I was still able to train because we had little groups that we would train at the precinct. Um, you know, the precinct that's right across from Metropolitan Hospital. That's what we used, was the 23rd precinct back then. I, I don't know what it is now, but we used to train there. Uh, it was usually boxing and just body avoid, uh, avoiding techniques and that kind of stuff. A lot of Aikido style techniques, um, a lot of restraining techniques, like how can you restrain? Because when you're straining some, somebody that's on a drug, like, um, you know, acid or uh, those, those drugs that were wrong in the 90s, <clears throat> they're not really aware of their pain receptors don't fire in the same way. And so if you're restraining them and you over-restrain them, you can break their hand or you can break their wrist. And um, they're not able to understand it. That that's what's happening. So you have to be able to restrain them and protect them at the same time. And, you know, that's only best done in movies, right? <laughs> in real life, it's a whole different story. So, um, yeah, I learned a lot of, about doing that and working with some really good police officers in um, out of the 23rd. One of my favorite questions to ask people is about the stories that they carry, that they've taken from life. Now, you've got this, this interesting background, even though you, know, you talked about this 10-year gap in formal training that you were not only still training, but I, I, I'm going to venture to say what you learned from that time not only helped you in your martial arts, but I would say likely defines who you are as a martial artist now. So what do you... Go yeah, I would, I would have to agree. Okay. So and... when we look at, at your past, and, and I'm going to guess that you might go to that 10-year period, if I asked you for your favorite martial arts story, what would that be? It's not a fancy story. Um, it's a pretty simple story. But, but I'll, if I reflect back, right, to that period, I, I trained very hard in, in Guyana. You know, um, I, I was on the national team, and I um, did a lot of tournaments. And so when I came to the U.S., I did want to continue training. And I went to the um, Sixth Avenue um, Kyoshin Kai um, Karate Dojo or Masayama Dojo to train, because that was the closest thing to the style, the Shotokan style that we were doing and the way we did Shotokan. Because we did a very hard style, a lot of punches, kicks. Um, even though it was non-contact, it was like contact. And my sensei recommended me to go there. Um, but I couldn't afford it. It was $120 a month <laughs> or something thereabout. You know, uh, I think that was, that was what I was making a week or something back then. So there's no way I could afford that. So I did a lot of different training. And it was in, in and I think I was young then, and I really didn't have a lot of experience. But I, I still undertook that journey of finding out about other martial arts styles. So I trained kendo for a month, couple of months. I did ninjutsu, aiki jujitsu, jujitsu, judo, you know, with different people that I knew. And for the most part, it was all free. I mean, I added what I knew from Shotokan, so it was an exchange. Uh, historically, a lot of martial artists go on that journey where when they do that, though, they have already attained mastery in something. I, I hadn't. Um, and they go to test themselves out to understand what is it they truly know 
And was it, what is it that they are still learning? What are their gaps? What are their strengths? I mean, that's the most important thing to understand about yourself. What are you really good at? And that's what you should lead with, right? I think one of the things that I have noticed about myself is that I'm really good at being aware. Um, and that's what my story is about. Um, I was at Brookdale Hospital in Brooklyn. And if you're familiar with that area, it's not the best, the most savory area uh, after 9 p.m. Um, I was doing my um, pharmacy residency, and I came out late. I think it was around 11, and I had like a, uh, a block and a half to go to get to the parking garage. And the bridge from the hospital to the garage was out. They, they were doing some renovations, so I couldn't go across. I had to walk on the street. And up ahead of me, I noticed this individual coming towards me. And I don't know, there was something about how nonchalant he was and how like disengaged with everything that was going on around him that just struck me as odd. It just didn't seem right at 11 o'clock. If you're walking, I mean, on the street, you're going somewhere and you're trying to get there quickly. You're not just loitering around per se, right? Mm. Um, so I, I, it just didn't feel right. And so I just started looking around and I looked across, I saw the garage and I saw uh, the garage, the attendant that was standing at the entrance, but he had his back turned. And um, as this guy approached me and I was just being very aware and he just suddenly took a swing at me. In his hand, he had like a six-inch piece of pipe, probably loaded with lead. Um, I tell you, if that had struck me, that would have been it. I would have been down, and he would have taken whatever he wanted to take off me and just left. Um, but because I was aware and because I was kind of looking at him, I was looking at him but trying to appear as I wasn't. I, I really couldn't cross the street. Um, it, I didn't have time. Um, because that's what I would have done. And this is what I would tell people. And if you notice something like that, cross the street, you know, free at distance. I didn't have the chance. Um, but I was aware, so I was able to duck. I mean, that's all I did. I was able to duck. A thing went over my head, and I crossed the street. I ran across the street right away. I mean, I live by my head. If I had gotten struck in my head, I probably wouldn't have been able to do anything afterwards. You know, I don't know what the injury would be. And that story still stays with me very vividly. Uh, it was a very close brush, I think, um, but a very intentional, uh, somebody that was, was very intentional about hurting me. Um, and, it, you know, that's possible. That happens. And, and it's just one move. There's not, it's not two moves, three moves. Um, it's just one, one thing, very quick, very fast. Um, one move and one quick response to avoid it, you know? So we call that Tai Tabaki, right? Body movement and very quick. Um, and that's why I always emphasize at the dojo, being able to spatially align yourself and relate yourself to something, to another person. It's called Sotai, Sotai training. So it's not a, not a really, you know, big story with a lot of involvement, but um, <laughs> it happened really fast. I mean, less than a minute, I was across the, the street. And the, the attendant had turned, and he had son, seen the end of that, and then he started yelling. And that. Um, I got away. I got to tell you, my heart rate was like, at, uh, it was up there <laughs> for like an hour afterwards. I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if it was up for days. You know, I don't know that I would be able to sleep at all after an incident like that because that is. I, yeah, indeed. I sat in my car for like, you know, a couple of minutes just shaking, you know, mm. um, trying to get over it. I, I don't, I dissected that afterward. Um, and then I realized like well, why I did what, you know, I, I didn't really, did a, I didn't do a whole lot of thinking, to be quite honest. I, I noticed, and then I responded, and then I went across the street. That was that. We talk on this show often about awareness and how important awareness is, because when you have a circumstance like this where there's no, there's no real root cause, right? It's not you bump into somebody at a bar that creates the violence. This is the, the ultimate definition of random violence. And when something is random, it becomes that much harder to detect, to predict, 
but because you were aware, you had the opportunity to not die or be severely injured. And it's something that when I talk with my non-martial arts friends, they don't always understand. I mean, I, I think, I, I suspect you, I certainly know I do. I'm going to guess the majority of folks listening right now don't like sitting with their back to the door at a restaurant. Right? Why do we do that? Because we have, most of us have been trained to be alert, to be aware, to observe, to try and detect trouble before it comes up. I've been in circumstances, you know, parties or whatever, where I've been with friends and said, we need to go now. Mm -hmm. And I'm not always right, but the risk versus the reward, right? You know, mm -hmm. and, and I think that that is are on the side of caution. Yeah. Um, and the opposite is true from a strategy perspective that when we assume those positions in, in the restaurant and per se, right, we're taking that position of power because we're taking the higher ground. It gives us the bigger view. Um, it helps us to understand the whole room, right? It helps us to see the exits and so forth. Um, but if we switch things around and put somebody else in that position purposefully, we're giving them the position of power. Maybe we'll have somebody sitting across from them that can alert us to danger. But in my business, where I have a lot of executive level meetings, where I'm trying to convince a, uh, you know, a group of folks about a medical situation and, and the benefits versus the risk, sometimes that conversation is better presented with that, to that person when they are in a position of power, or even if it's perceived. And so that strategy is a martial strategy that's applied to the boardroom. And so there's a lot of strategy around the samurai mentality and samurai art that are directly applied to business. <clears throat> and so that's one of the things we do at the dojo is that we have um, team events where we would invite um, groups from different corporations to come. And we will talk to them about awareness, awareness of each other, trust, building strong relationships, leading with their strengths, interaction with each other, um, setting up a boardroom, conveying a message in the right way for maximal impact and so forth. And being very concise and timely in so doing. How do those conversations go? Are people receptive to those? Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, this year we have had two groups um, both groups coming from um, uh, my company, actually, Johnson & Johnson, but we also had a hotel group that came as well. Um, and they spent, usually these, they spent about an hour at the dojo. Um, we, you know, generally started out with Thai Sabaki movements, and we make it a lot of fun. Um, during my early days uh, of studying Shotokan Karate, I, I wasn't able to always pay my dues. And then my teacher told me, well, fine, you could start, you could pay for your classes by teaching the, the young, the, the, the kid group, the youth um, group. And so I taught them. And he told me um, the key to training with young kids. He says, start with fun, make it fun. Okay. Never, never shy them about doing something wrong, but I always look when they do something good and praise them. So start with fun always praise, never, ever lose your temper. Never, you know, be that bad example, right? <clears throat> never get mad with them or let them show or show them that you're upset and always end on fun. Always end with something fun. And <laughs> that's exactly what I do until uh, this day. <laughs> um, when, I, when we have these cooperative groups come in, you know, we always start with a fun activity. We try to figure out what their strengths are and praise them about it and then utilize those strengths to have like a very focused um, initiative that they are interested in working on. And then we end on fun, something fun again, you know. And there's a lot of that in martial arts. Um, it's just like any sport, you know, there's a lot of fun to be, to be had. <clears throat> and I think we downplay the fun. One of the things I've observed, and I've spent a lot of time teaching a lot of different groups, I've, and, and ranging from, you know, working with, with people for, you know, maybe I'll get them for 30 minutes and never again up to, I had my own school for a couple of years. And I found that if people are having fun, 
their mind is so much more open and receptive to everything else that you're doing. If they're not having fun, they're closed off and it's going to be really hard to get any knowledge crammed into that brain. Right. And they're not coming back. Right. You know, and that's where the dojo should be. The dojo should be a safe place where you come there to learn about yourself. The medium is martial arts. Um, the players are all the students, the, the teacher who's really, the, you know, since he means he had the person, you have gone there before, you traveled that road before, so you know the pitfalls and whatnot, right? It doesn't necessarily mean that you're a master of that road, you know? You're also trying to get there as well. I mean, you're just a bit farther along than the rest. Um, so you're the guide, and um, you experiment to see what your strengths are, to figure out what your strengths are using the medium of martial arts. Um, and, and the different martial arts depend on that sensei, right? what he knows best to lead that group. I mean, if he does a good job at it, folks figure out what their strengths are. I think life is too short to be working on your weaknesses unless they're really crucial, like there's something you really need to start out. I think that we should identify what our strengths are as a person and then develop those and lead with those. The weakness, the, the things that you're weak on, you know, you, you partner up with somebody that's strong in those areas. Um, that's just, just my feeling about, um, I'm a big strength finder uh, person. <laughs> mm. Well, we all have our strengths, right? And, and we can go furthest when we're all leveraging our own strengths. I mean, that, that's, that's leadership 101, right? Identify everyone's strengths and play to those strengths. Absolutely. Give them, give them a position that leverages it. Right. And it's the same in the dojo. You know, that, that's what you need to empower. You find out as a teacher and then you empower that person along their strengths. And then you, you, you know, develop, help them develop the, the weakness, weak areas so that they're as well-rounded as possible, but mainly getting them strong and where they're strong already. Right. And I'm going to put a, a very fine point on this because sometimes people miss these and, you know, maybe it'll stir the pot a little bit. If someone is really good at forms and they love doing forms, and all you ever do is harp on them about their poor fighting skill, you're missing an opportunity. And the moment someone leaves your school, your dojo, dojang, whatever you choose to call it, and they don't mm -hmm. come back, you can't help them. Mm -hmm. So to give them the freedom to develop as the martial artist that they want to become, I think is, is a gift as an instructor. Because everyone's different, and thus everyone's place in the martial arts is going to be a little different. I, that's exactly, I mean, that's a big ongoing conversation. You know, I got to tell you, I kind of stay out of the conversations around those kind of things, um, and I don't follow them too, too deeply. I mean, if people are gravitating to those conversations, then that's part of how they're defining themselves. I don't study martial art to be... Um, because I am living in a martial society where I need to have that level of awareness, you know? Um, some, it, it's good to have it and it saved me, but that's not what, it, what I'm doing every day. Every day I'm trying to better myself. I'm trying to evolve and I'm trying to become stronger and I'm, I have to be very honest and I have to be very, very truthful. I, I think Bruce Lee said, um, it's very hard to admit something, the truth about yourself. I'm, I'm paraphrasing, right? Yeah. But he said that it's very hard to accept what's true about you, what, what is actually weak or bad about you that you need to work on. And you need to use your strengths, leverage your strengths to work against, to develop that weakness or that, that thing that needs to be better, right? And so... Um, if you look at that, I sent you a, a drawing with a Buddha, a mask, and a sword, and the mm -hmm. word Shin below it. And to me, that's, that's my ideology right there, and it's why I do Shinkendo. Um, it's why I evolved to study sword, because sword training is very austere. Um, People lived and died by the sword during 
the samurai era. And for many thousands of years, I was talking to my students only this Sunday about people building their houses in such a way that it would, the steps would creak in such a way that when people are coming up, you'll know if they're coming up the back stairs or the front stairs or they're walking on the, which part of the porch. Can you imagine that, that mindset of fair, people living like that on a daily basis, always on guard? We don't sleep that way, right? Today, we close our doors. We're more than, more than likely, people are not breaking in, you know, right? <laughs> Statistically, more than it's likely, not people happen. are not, to, right? Yeah, to take you out. But that's how people live. Today, when you approach the training of sword, you got to approach it in that same way, though. For you to get there, you have to approach it in that way. That's the only way you will learn what's true about you. When you do Kasagari from heaven to earth, from top, Jodan to Gedan, it's like you're defining your entire life there. You're, if your your cut, your kessa, or your punch, right, is not true and controlled and directed and under your control and guidance, you're not living your life the right way. Every time you do one cut from top to bottom, it has to really be an expression of your entire life because that's how you're defining yourself every time. That's how you learn the truth about yourself. And that's how you face and you understand all the different masks that we wear in society or society requires of us. And that's how we learn how to shed those and to understand exactly what our expression in life is. And that's how we obtain that realization, that, that self-realization. And that's how your life becomes art or, you know, something that others admire. That's how you express yourself with beauty. And that's how society looks at you. And that's how you're able to impact society. Because ultimately, that's what you want your life to do, right? You want your life to be clean and pure and strong as much as you can have with yourself. And the next level is your family and your closer society, right? Your friends and family. And then third is the society at large. You want to be able to have that impact. I mean, I think underlying each and every one of us, we, we want to have that. But what we do today is we go out to that third piece. And we do ridiculous things and we put on shows and we do things that we post on Facebook, uh, just doing ridiculous stuff with attention and so forth. And I understand that there's a culture like that for social media and so forth. But we're missing so much. And we should always, we should all start with ourselves, you know, and then expand out. And that, that drawing, you know, uh, so one of my longest students, um, and he's one of our instructors. He's also an artist. And he was an artist at, uh, in training at Northeastern University while he was training with me. And we would have these conversations. Uh, this was like, I don't know, 10 years ago or so. We would sketch things out. And um, he was doing a show on, the, on different masks that has evolved through society historically over thousands of years. And um, this all came together in pieces. And um, he, we ended up putting this together and presenting it to Obata Toshishiro Obata Sensei um, as our concept for Shinkendo, so encompassing a lot of the philosophy in Shinkendo and so forth from our dojo. And that's why our dojo is called So Shinkan. Shin means true, you know, so it's a place of earnest training, learning about the truth, whatever that is, you know, about sword, about yourself and so forth. Tell us a bit about Shinkendo, if you would. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So um, I make this analogy sometimes, and, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll do it this time again. I, I look, when I look at Bruce Lee, I see a man that truly understood Kung Fu, um, truly understand the concepts, the, you know, the use of... Um, the techniques of Kung Fu, but he also understand other martial arts. And what he did is he broke it down for us, for the world, right? He brought it to us. He broke it down. He made it accessible. Um, he just cracked it open for everybody to practice it and to learn that martial art. And then 
you know, if you think about it, he talks about farm without farm and, you know, so not being captured into all this stuff, right? I think that Obato uh, Kaiso did the same thing for Japanese swordsmanship. He truly cracked it open and brought it to us as a whole and across the world. And if you look at swordsmanship in Japan today, there's still hundreds of schools. They still practice rigidly by the lines of that practice that was done, you know, several hundred years ago. And Obata Sensei studied a lot of those styles. And while he was in Japan, he became a sensei in the Wakahoma. And the Wakahoma is a Japanese stunt group, but they're also responsible for ensuring the authenticity of all Japanese martial arts as expressed in movies. So if you go and you see a movie and they're, they're doing Yari or they're doing Naginata, Obata Sensei would be the person that would say, that's wrong, that's right, we, they didn't do it like that, this is how they did it. So for many years, his job was to go and learn other martial arts. And that's how, that is how he was able to cross train across different schools because he had that job and those senses understood that that's what he was doing. Because you know, there's a lot of secrecy across different sword styles, right? And one sword style wouldn't accept a practitioner from another sword style. And what Kaiso learned and noticed is that one style did bataho. So if you look at Iaido, Iaido uh, as a Japanese swordsman uh, style, it's great and I'm not criticizing it, but it really focuses only on drawing the sword very powerfully and one or two techniques afterwards, right? They don't focus on Tachiuchi, which is sparring. They don't focus on, you know, Suburi, which is strong, swinging. They don't do any cutting, but now they do, but before they didn't, right? And Tamishigeri or, or target cutting is, is a recent phenomenon, I would say, for the last maybe 10, 15 years, right? So, Shin Kendo, if you broke it down by the name, right, what it means, Shin Kendo, Shin means true, Ken is sword, Do is the way of. If you put that together, it means the way of the true sword or the true way of the sword. And the only way you could study sword is you have to do all the components, right? So if you're, if you're practicing karate and all you did was punches, you're missing out on your kicks. You know, and if you don't put them together, then kicks, punches, combination, then you're, you're missing out and using everything. So Shinkendo puts it all together and it most closely mimics how samurai actually practiced sword 2000 years ago. So we do suburi, strong suburi, how to swing the sword and transition from different cuts. Bataho, how to draw the sword very powerfully and generally from a standing position. If you're in a sitting position and somebody's attacking you, you're missing out. You know, you're, you're at a disadvantage. You don't want to be in that position. So you don't sit. If you're going to have your sword with you, don't sit. Simple. And it was very uncommon for people to take their long sword into an enclosed area. That just don't make sense. So we don't practice from sitting position. Now, if you're hiding and you're hiding your training, because people are looking at you and you're training in an enclosed setting, then that makes sense. Because for whatever reason, maybe it was banned after World War II and you had to practice in an enclosed building. So I'm not, I'm, I'm really not being critical of that way of practicing as a whole, right? But I'm saying from, a, from Shinkendo, we don't do that. Um, kata, we have 10 katas. So you can practice on your own, right? And those are very simple to learn, but very difficult to master. We do Tachiuchi, which is sparring, and we use, um, we don't use Shinai, we use something called Anzento, or we use waxwood, which are very sturdy um, pieces of wood, actually, and it allows us to strike very powerfully um, and safely, because when, when, these, when a waxwood breaks, it breaks on the inside first. And so you hear it breaking on the inside, but it doesn't break on the outside, so it doesn't get splinters, so you could put it away. If you use Boken and it breaks, it'll break, it'll splinter, it'll shatter, and that can cause injuries. And that's how hard we strike. And then the last thing that we also practice in 
you know, those four, five aspects is tamishigeri, which is actual cutting with a real shinken, a live blade. And we do, we do yaito practice as well. Um, and then we graduate to tamishigeri. So that's the five main aspects of Shinkendo. It's called go, Goren Goho Gogyo. Tuburi, uh, Tanaren Gato, Tamishigeri, Tachiuchi, and Batoho. And also, if, when you, once you become, you know, Hakui or Black Belt, um, we also practice Nito Ken, which is how to use two long swords. The concept of that is if you're in battle and you lose, um, whatever shield you had, or um, you're fighting multiple people, two swords are better than one. And so it gives you a wider radius of um, control. And if you, if you extend your arms and extend your swords on both ends, uh, you have a really wide radius, right? So it's like having a bow or a spear, yari. And so you could, you, you could be able to control that space better with two swords. And so we have a whole curriculum on Nito Ken as well. Nice. The the what you were talking about with the waxwood, you know, that's something mm -hmm. I'd never I'd never known. I've I've trained in a number of styles and, and whenever we went to sword practice, it was always you know, it was either a, a hardwood boken, as you said, or a shanai, but it makes complete sense. You know, we don't tend to think of something that is harder, that is sturdier as necessarily being safer. I think right. there's some I think there's some interesting analogies to draw from that to apply to life indeed you know, that i like yeah and we have very low injuries in shinkendo i've never in 10 years we have not i've not had one real injury you know yeah people get small injuries but we've never had any real injury and that's because of the way we train the way we teach you know so you have to teach very safely because it's a very dangerous art right and and I like Shinkendo because if somebody's truly dedicated to understanding themselves and they want to learn something that they, you can't really use in society, you know, I mean, except for Texas, I don't think you can carry a sword anywhere, <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, but, uh, but you're really using an instrument to chip away at all the things that you need. You, you're molding, sculpturing yourself, you know. No, but that's not to say that Shinkendo as a whole can be applied for self-defense um, because it's, it's tough. We train very hard and you sweat in every class and you become very strong. And without your sword in your hand, if you just do any one of those strikes, uh, I think it'll be very impactful on whoever's on the receiving end. You know? mm. so, that makes sense. We do do a lot of that as well. Wow. Now, what... What are your goals? What's coming up for you, for your school, your, your system in the future? You know, what's on the horizon? Well, next year, I'm going to turn 50. <laughs> um, I also do Tayamaryu, um, and I think I'm going to be testing for my fourth degree, uh, fifth degree black belt next year. So that's something I'm starting to work on from a personal, uh, personal perspective. Um, I think for next year, we, we just finished 10 years at this location and we've had Obada Sensei come, um, and train with us once and then two years ago and next year and in the future, I would like to have his son, um, Soke Toshishiro, um, Yukishiro Obato come with us and train with us more. I, I think that, um, the dojo is at a point where we really have the right mix of senior students and and intermediate students so we can really take our practice to that next level mm -hmm. and i know it's taken us 10 years to get there but i'm really excited about it and it's really a great place for beginner students too because now they can really get that full breadth of um seeing shinkendo you know being a uh, practice and understand where they are what the other levels look like and what the really senior guys are doing that they could get there, you know? So I'm really excited about that um, for the future Shinkendo in Boston. Nice. Now, if anyone's listening and maybe they're in the area and they want to drop by or, you know, start taking classes with you, find you on social media, or, or, you know, even just reach out to say hello, how would people find out more about you and your school? 
it's it's very easy. Our website is shinkendoboston.com. That's one word. S h i n k e n d o b o s t o n. One word. dot com. If you go on our website, there's a a place there for you to send us a message. We usually reply the same day or or the next day. We require before people join the dojo that you observe a few classes and we get to know you and understand a little bit about your goals. And um, but we're very open. Um, we allow you to train with us for a couple of times just so you can get the feel of it as well. Because shinkendo is one of those arts that you have to practice for a long time before you start to feel comfortable. And we're willing to work with you to get you there. Nice. And of course, we're going to link that website and and other things of relevance relevance that we've talked about today on our website, Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio dot com. Cool. So, I want to thank you for your time. This has been a lot of fun. I've really enjoyed talking to you, getting to know you. You know, I've been looking forward to this as we said at the top of the show for quite a while. And I'd like to ask one more favor as we fade away. What parting words would you give to the folks listening today? Um, I would say that whatever you do in your life, make it make it art. Make your life art. Make it something beautiful, and make it something for people to look at and behold, and make it something that takes people right away. And and everybody could do that because everybody has something that's special about them. Um, and you know, you just you just got to be brave to figure it out, um, and don't be afraid to do that. And if you study shinkendo, we'll help you do that as well. But you know, it doesn't have to be shinkendo. It, it'll be it can be anything, anything that you do. Put your best foot forward, um, and you'll be happy that you did that. <laughs> the more time I spend with this show, the more people I get to talk to, the more I realized how true it is that we are more alike than we are different as people, as martial artists, in our journeys, just trying to find our path. And I feel a kinship with everyone that I speak with, but especially. Today with Sensei Bakas, even though we don't train in the same styles and we don't have the same cultural background and didn't grow up anywhere close to the same place, the way he spoke of martial arts just clicks for me. And I do hope that I get the opportunity to meet him soon, train with him, and really just see if if those similarities. If that that desire to to bow to someone, shake their hand, share some sweat, if that really does hold up, God, I'd put money on it. <laughs> Thank you, sir, for coming on the show today. If you want to check out the show notes with the photos and the transcript and everything else that we do, you can find all that at WhistlekickMartialArtsRadio dot com. And of course, you can find this show at that website on YouTube, in your podcast feed, and I hope that you will share it with others. The show continues to grow, which brings us new and exciting guests, and that allows us to grow more, and that allows us to bring on more guests. It's a cycle, just like our training. Don't forget, Podcast 15 saves you 15% at whistlekick.com, and don't forget you can follow us on social media. We are at Whistlekick on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and my direct email is jeremy at whistlekick.com, and I love hearing from listeners. Thank you for your time today. Thank you for your support. And I hope everything goes well for you. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. <laughs>